He's one of the most famous priests on the planet. I've always believed in God. He's a man of peace. Those who are striving for change in South Africa by peaceful means. Yet he doesn't completely renounce violence. I am not a pacifist. He was an outspoken opponent of injustice in his country. If apartheid is not dismantled, then we are going to have a bloodbath. But now he feels let down by the democratic regime in South Africa. We seem to have lost the plot. And injustice in other countries still appalls him. You have roads that uh, only Israeli Jews are allowed to travel on. But he's never lost his sense of humor. <laughs> Two years ago, he said he was retiring from public life. Don't call me, I'll call you, he told the world's media. But we did call him. Hello. And my guest today on the Frost interview is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. When was the first time, Desmond, when you realised that you believed in God? I've always believed in God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think that it was something you took in with your mother's milk kind of thing. I, I was born into a family that um, was, a, was a family of practising Christians. Was there ever a moment when you worried for a second that you had lost your beliefs? No. Uh, what I've always experienced, or I've experienced on, on, on quite a number of occasions, especially during the time of the struggle, was uh, anger at God. I mean, I really got very angry with God uh, and uh, would rail at God and say, what, for goodness sake, how can you allow such and such to happen? South Africa, a country founded by white settlers, has had racism embedded in its history for centuries. And it is this which inspired Desmond's spirit to fight injustice from his earliest childhood. Raised on the outskirts of Johannesburg, Africa's richest city, the poor suburb of Sophia Town, where his family had lived, was demolished by the apartheid regime as a deliberate policy of ethnic cleansing. By then, Desmond had become a teacher, but in protest at South Africa's racial education policies, he decided to train for the priesthood. His mentor was an Anglican priest called Father Trevor Huddleston. I remember when I was about nine, when uh, my mother was working as a domestic worker at a, a institute for black, uh, blind people, uh, and re recalled, I didn't know him then, but I recalled this white priest in a, in a long flowing cassock doffing his hat to my mother. And I mean, that struck me as being quite odd, a white man lifting his head to my mother, a black woman, and a black woman not an edu particularly educated, she's a domestic worker, but even more incredibly was the fact that I went into hospital and had, I mean, I had TB, and I was in hospital for 20 months. Almost two years. Yeah, huh? uh, and almost all of that time, Trevor Harrison visited me regularly. And you don't know just what it did for uh, one's self-esteem. Here is an important white man coming to visit me in a, a township urchin. Uh, and yeah, I mean, his influence on me and on others uh, was quite phenomenal. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word, apartheid. 
And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily, and perhaps much better be described, as a policy of good neighborliness. Accepting that there are differences between people. But while these differences exist, and you have to acknowledge them, at the same time, you can live together, aid one another, but that it can best be done when you act as good neighbors always do. Even if this means making one group second-class citizens? No, I don't think that in the far future it means <laughs> making second-class citizens. Coopers would have uh, enjoyed that. I mean, sure. What are your thoughts today about... Favut. Favut. He was a very, very clever man. He thought, I mean, that um, you could deal with things here by being, by being smart. Uh, but he was clear that... Uh, Black people in South Africa had no position higher than certain forms of labor. He said so. He said quite, quite clearly right. in Parliament, he said, why we must introduce Bantu education. On the 21st of March, 1960, when Desmond was 28, South Africa exploded in violence. Police shot down unarmed protesters in what became known as the Sharpville Massacre. I was in my final year at uh, Theological College. I was, I was already um, going to be ordained at the end of that year. 69 people were killed and most of them were shot in the back as they were running away, protesting against the past laws. I remember it as a, as a moment when um, you realized uh, that black life was cheap. It was an awful time, I, I mean, where you were aware that uh, for most white South Africans, we were human, but, you know, kind of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. They are human, but, you know, uh, they're not very clean, are they? I mean, um, they, they're not very clever, are they? Uh, they, oh, and, and, and they, they steal, don't they? I mean, you know, you can't, you can't leave anything uh, that, that you think is uh, valuable when they are around. You'll use the main entrance if you're white. You went into a post office, you, you had to use separate entrances. We'd just come back from England uh, with our, our youngest child. We had four children. The youngest was born in London. And, and, and she saw some children playing in a, on swings and so on. And she said, uh, I want to go and play. And, and we had to say, no, Sujat, you can't. And she said, but there are other children playing. And, and it was incredibly difficult. I mean, it really, to explain. it really just made you feel, I wish the ground could open and swallow me up. How do I tell my child that, yes, you are a child, but you're not a child like those other children who are on the swings, on the roundabouts? We lived in ghettos. Black children were also getting uh, government... Uh, school feeding. When Favot took over, he stopped it because he said, and, and this was his reasoning, uh, we, we can't feed all of these children, so we are not going to feed some. I, I mean, it's a bizarre thing, I mean, to say, no, we're not going to try and, and cure uh, any people who have TB because we can't cure all of them, so we will cure none. I mean, that is... Uh, bizarre in the extreme. And then there was beginning to be some forms of meaningful protest. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people.
And I think the time has come for us to consider, in the light of our experiences in this stay at home, whether the methods which we have applied so far are adequate. Nelson Mandela's ANC did adopt violence as a strategy after Sharpeville, but he and the ANC leadership were soon to be arrested, tried, and sentenced to life in prison. Protest in South Africa was harshly dealt with, and hundreds of political prisoners were sent to Robben Island, where Mandela and the others were breaking rocks in the quarry. Then in 1976, the country exploded again. This time it was children who were shot down. In 1976, uh, June the 16th, uh, South Africa never became the same again after that. Our young people, who had nothing, I mean, except perhaps stones, took on the apartheid system. They said, we've had enough and we will not buckle under the system. 1976 is a very, very important date uh, in our struggle uh, calendar. In fact, you wrote to John Vorster, the then Prime Minister, Prime Minister yes. just six weeks before Soweto, and you were, in, in a way, predicting what came eventually to happen. I don't know that it took a great deal of uh, prescience I mean, I lived in, in, in the black community and I, I was aware of the levels of frustration that our people were experiencing. The fact of writing a letter came at a time when I was in retreat. And for me, it seemed like, you know, one could say I had a kind of God pressure. Uh, and, and, and the letter that I wrote, wrote itself. But the, the prime minister, and, and his party uh, dismissed my letter contemptuously. In fact, they suggested that uh, I had been put up to it. It wasn't, it wasn't my own uh, composition that the white um, opposition party uh, had really had a hand in, in its production. I mean, there you were about four, five, six weeks before I'd, I'd said, uh, I'm, I'm very fearful that un, unless they, they take steps to show that they hear our critic, uh, that we were going to have an explosion. <laughs> were you ever tempted for a moment to go along with the conclusion that people like Nelson Mandela came to that there had to be uh, some, some violence of yes. some kind. I, for a very, very long time, I, I did hope that uh, the world would, would hear our plea. And that is why we urged the world to apply sanctions and said to them, this is really the last non-violent way of seeking to change the system in, in South Africa. And, and of course, as you know, I mean, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, as she then was, uh, Ronald Reagan in America were dead set against uh, sanctions. I have, will have nothing to do with any organization that practices violence. I've never seen anyone from the ANC or the PLO or the IRA and would not do so. When the ANC says that they will target British companies, this shows what a typical terrorist organization it is. And it was l very, very largely because of the anti-apartheid movement. In America, it was particularly uh, young people, students at uh, universities and colleges who, who helped to change the moral climate. But I, I held on to non-violence in very large measure, I think, uh, for strategic reasons. If we went the way of the armed struggle, that we probably would not stand 
too much of a chance against a government that was armed to the teeth. I did get to the point of saying, I am not a pacifist, uh, because I mean, I would say, I couldn't uh, want to sit by, say, whilst Hitler was throwing children into gas chambers, uh, but that I was a peace lover and uh, a peace advocate, that I, I recognized that there might come a time when you would have to say that uh, non-violent means uh, we're no longer viable. We have been deluding ourselves too often. We have, th we have thought that there were nice white people that there were nice newspapers, newspapers that cared about our struggle, for our struggle. Why our struggle is going to succeed is not just because of numbers. Our struggle is going to succeed because it is a just struggle. The sanctions in terms of South Africa and surprisingly, the sporting sanctions. Yes. That yes. was a real occasion when sanctions worked. Yes. I mean, the, the, the sports boycott was, I think, particularly effective psychologically because even as now, I mean, uh, South Africans are sports mad, especially cricket and, and rugby. And for them, uh, to be prevented from playing international sport. I mean, rugby, not to be able to play against the All Blacks, against Australia. That, I think, um, got them, I mean, it hit them in the solar plexus. By the 1980s, South Africa was cursed with violence in the streets and increasing isolation abroad. The white government of President F.W. de Klerk started secret negotiations with the ANC, which would eventually lead to Nelson Mandela's release and then the first democratic elections in the country's history. Mm. That was a fantastic day. Many years later, I asked the clerk about that time. Had you met him before that or only afterwards? I met him only once before that. The next time he was brought to my office was shortly after my speech of the 2nd of February, when I announced to him he would be released on the 11th of February. And his immediate reaction was, no, it's too soon. And I said, Mr. Mandela, why is it too soon? He said, no, no, we need more time to prepare. <laughs> you say, Mr. Mandela, you've been in jail long enough. You will be released on the 11th. We will ne later negotiate about many other things, but this is not negotiable. Now let's negotiate about what time of the day and from which place are you going to be released? He laughed and he accepted. Uh, sometimes, uh, Mr. de Klerk does not get the credit that he, he deserves. I certainly pay a, a tribute to Mr. de Klerk, but have to say that uh, someone up there must really have been on our side or, or betting for us. Yes. Uh, because, I mean, when, when things were getting rough, I mean, after, after his release and and, and the build-up to our first democratic election. It was one of the roughest, one of the bloodiest periods in, in, in our history. It did seem as if there was a, a third force uh, that sought to undermine the process of uh, negotiations. And yes, I, I mean, when you think of the assassination of uh, Chris Honey. 
it really was touch and go. If we had had anyone but someone of the stature of Mandela, it would have been very, very difficult to have persuaded um, people uh, in his ranks to lay down their arms and getting people to say it's better to talk jaw jaw rather than whoa whoa. He had the stature uh, to persuade very many in his own party who thought uh, this is the wrong time uh, to want to lay down arms because uh, these, these guys are not really trustworthy. And on the very day that uh, Nelson Mandela was released, he came in fact, although you didn't at that point know each other very well, but he came to your home. Well, yes, he stayed overnight uh, uh, at Bishop's Court uh, and I didn't see a great deal of him because uh, his party uh, colleagues, uh, they were having their meetings. And the only time that I kept seeing him was that I, I was getting calls. Uh, this is the White House. Uh, this is uh, State House here. This is, I mean, various political leaders in, in the world were calling in to congratulate him, to wish oh, yeah. him well. Yes, I mean, it was, it was, it was quite amazing, yeah. But I mean, he's, his contribution is immeasurable. Um, his stature, uh, I mean, for someone who was the, the commander in chief of the military wing of the ANZ to be at the forefront of, uh, persuading people that it would be better for us to, to negotiate. It is better for us to lay down our arms. And, and then to try to live that out. I mean, you know, he invited to his uh, inauguration, he invited his wife, Kichela, one of the first people uh, to come and have lunch with him in, in, in State House was uh, the man who, who had been the prosecutor, uh, the man who had sent him to Robben Island, who in fact had asked for the death penalty. Uh, that was the first guy he invited to come and have lunch with him uh, when he became president. And he also invited the widows of political uh, leaders, most of whom were Afrikaners. And he went to visit the widow of Dr. Fervurt. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible guy. He's probably the second most famous South African after Nelson Mandela. And when his country obtained its first fully democratically elected government under Mandela, Desmond Tutu was given the crucial healing task of chairing the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, designed to deal with the horrors and abuses on both sides of the apartheid era. A stick was put inside your knees and you had to stretch your knees. During that period, you were suffocated. If you do not deal with a dark past such as ours, uh, effectively look the beast in the eye, that beast is not going to lie down quietly. It's going, as sure as anything, to come back and haunt you horrendously. Those pictures of you and other members of the commission, yeah. at times just had to close your eyes. What you heard was, was so yeah. destructive. Well... 
Mr. Malgas was describing uh, a form of torture that they gave him. Well, that happened on the on the very first day of uh, the the hearings, and and he was the last uh, witness uh, to testify. And I think I mean I don't know why he cried. I whether it was uh, the memory of what they had done to him or the fact that uh, because of his uh, disability, his mouth could not uh, articulate all that he wanted to say. Uh, and so he broke down. Uh, when he did, I mean, it, it just triggered me off. And I broke down. <laughs> it was a very great privilege because I mean, the people were amazing. And it was of all races. The people who came to testify were almost uniformly um, amazingly magnanimous, really. I mean, you The almost, victims, the, the, the... Yes, I mean, the people who had, who had suffered, uh, uh, some of them, some ghastly atrocities, they, they were just uh, amazing. Uh, we we were fortunate to be to be set where we were as facilitators. The real stars were were the people who came uh, to testify. I mean, those who were testifying as victims, uh, who when the, uh, on those occasions where some of them uh, met up with the perpetrators. Almost universally, they, they, they had a magnanimity that was just incredible. I mean, the, the, the readiness to, to, to forgive the perpetrators was, uh, yeah, I mean, just something out of this world. When you heard someone talking about what they, evil they had done, did you find it difficult not to hate those people? No, I, I think, I mean, that one of the things we kept having to remember uh, was uh, <laughs> that, you know, that saying, there but for the grace of God go I. You yeah, see, you, yeah. couldn't, you, you couldn't be hoity-toity. Uh, you didn't know if you had been exposed to the same circumstances, the pressures and the... Uh, influences that that particular person had had, do you know whether you would not have turned out as they turned out? Many of them, uh, I, I mean, I think, not all of them, but I think most of them were actually quite genuine uh, when they turned and, and asked for forgiveness uh, from the victims. Uh, they were not required to do that. So it, it was an incredible privilege to have been part of this, to be wounded healers, wounded healers, all of us. And we're re realizing it now more and more during this period uh, uh, that we are a wounded people. It's nearly two decades since apartheid gave way to democracy in South Africa. But Desmond Tutu is now seriously worried about the path his country seems to be taking. He's become more outspoken in his criticism of the government and the Rainbow Nation, of which he was once so proud. Are you sort of disappointed with how things have gone since 1994? I have to be realistic, obviously, and things could have been a great deal worse. But I, I still have this uh, deep sense that they could have been a great deal better. I think we've let the people down. In, in, in so far as you have an elite that uh, has done very, very well, for themselves, who have got quite, quite rich. 
and the bulk of the people are still where they were, or sometimes worse off, you know. Um, sometimes worse off. I mean, we still have children learning under trees. Now, now that is quite unconscionable, really, to have people uh, going to bed hungry. I mean, our economy is not madly prosperous, but then it is also not uh, one of the worst. But we seem to have um, lost the plot to some extent. I mean, in the educational sphere, uh, we are about as bad as the old dispensation could have been. Uh, I mean, most recently we had one of our nine provinces uh, where children were devoid of uh, uh, textbooks. And the textbooks were ordered, they were found dumped somewhere. People were paid uh, for carrying out that particular um, assignment, uh, but paid for nothing. Kailisha Township, on the outskirts of Cape Town, was an apartheid era squatter camp that still survives now in the new democracy. Desmond Tutu is the patron of Kailisha's Filani Nutrition Center which looks after mothers and children in desperate need and suffering from malnutrition. So where are we now, Desmond? This, this is their workshop. This is part of the liberation of our people, you know, because, as you know, I mean, you've seen examples already here. Poverty is something that actually almost destroys people. It can also, as it is doing just now, uh, be something that uh, is explosive. <laughs> bye bye. The coming of political freedom does not necessarily mean that you are going to have economic freedom. But, you know, it's 18 years since our first democratic election you would have hoped that by now most of the ugly features of poverty would have been got rid of. We also have got to say that one of the wonderful things is, yes, in the midst of this particular wilderness, you can have an oasis such as this one. In 2007, with a Nobel Prize under his belt, for his contribution to peace in his own land. Desmond Tutu embarked on a new career as a world statesman. The elders can become a fiercely independent and robust force for good. The dream child of businessman Richard Branson and musician Peter Gabriel, and under the auspices of Nelson Mandela, the elders were formed with the idea that former world leaders could bring their stature and their wisdom to bear in the cause of world peace. One of the reasons why they involved Nelson Mandela was that there are very few people who would say nay to him. <laughs> uh, if, if he invites you, uh, you'd have to have a very, very good reason uh, not to accede to his request. When the elders recently held a meeting in London, I took the opportunity to continue my conversation with Desmond, who brought along another elder, President Jimmy Carter. Sir Richard Branson invited us to come down to his island in the Caribbean, and uh, Archbishop and I went along with uh, about 30 or 40 other people to talk about the early plans or possibilities for the elders. We disagreed with a lot of it. Over a period of time, Richard and uh, Peter uh, changed their plans, and then they were formed fairly uh, certainly about six or seven years ago, and then they went to Nelson Mandela, who really has been the godfather of the elders, and so he, he introduced us, and we, and we began our work together five years ago. What's the most important quality an elder should have? 
We should be old. <laughs> 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 no, uh, I, I think, I mean, the, one of the most important is independence, uh, that you, you should be able to speak out fearlessly and, and not uh, be able to succumb to uh, pressure. Uh, and, and that is one of the reasons why it has to be people who are no longer in, in, an, in, in, in office uh, and are not aspiring uh, to hold office. And uh, a modicum of wisdom, uh, <laughs> uh, or pretend, I mean, that, no, 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 no pretend, because it, it is people who, who have a remarkable, a remarkable range of uh, experience. Uh, and I think that uh, you, you also have uh, a reputation for integrity. Over the past five years, the elders have covered a lot of ground. From East Jerusalem... I don't think anyone would ever claim that the demolition of someone's home or the confiscation of a home in which the family has lived for many generations is fair or justice or peaceful. So we congratulate you on this peaceful demonstration and hope you will soon be successful. To the Korean Peninsula. See you again. To Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast. Yes, yes. To Sudan. We hope that we can do something that will make a significant difference, that will bring peace to this land. And to Zimbabwe. Well, not quite. They've been barred entry by Robert Mugabe's regime. What are the places where... where you can see now that you've made a difference. Well, we basically fill vacuums in the world. We think that if the United Nations Security Council is adequately addressing an issue of the United States or Great Britain or the European community <clears throat> is dealing with an issue uh, effectively, we don't get involved. But where there kind of is a, a need that, that can be filled by us uniquely, that's when we decide to take on an issue. For instance, uh, going to North Korea is not a common thing to do. And we, when we go to the Middle East, we meet with the Israelis, we meet with the Jordanians, we meet with Fatah, we meet with Hamas leaders, we go to Gaza, we go to Syria, we go to Egypt, and then we put together our recommendations and make them public. So these are the kind of things that the elders do. We would, we would hope, I mean, that uh, our interventions would be uh, strategic in, in interventions. Uh, I mean, we don't have limitless uh, resources, uh, but we want to be able to have used them um, strategically uh, where they, they make, as it were, the most uh, impact. We have, at, at some point in, in our evolution, uh, said we, we need to be extremely careful that we don't think we have to comment of, on every single uh, situation. Uh, don't let's want to spread ourselves too thin. Um, we are aware of that. Uh, my own uh, concern has been that I thought we were uh, probably punching below our weight. Um, because I think, I mean, if you've got a group that has a Jimmy Carter, a Kofi Annan, a Mary Robinson, uh, yeah. and, and they make an utterance, the, the one would have expected that the world would probably sit up and take notice. When the elders visited Jerusalem in 2009, some of them were horrified by what they witnessed. More than three years later, those opinions have become the consensus in their group. I would say at the beginning, only three or four of us elders were deeply concerned about the rights of the Palestinians and therefore bringing peace to Israel. But as we discussed it for two or three years, eventually I would say we reached complete consensus and unanimity in pointing out the fact that there ought to be a cessation of Israeli confiscation of, uh, of Palestinian territory 
and a resumption of the 1967 borders with small modifications as a basis for peace. And this is the official position of the United Nations and the United States and, and, Europe, and the European Union, but they don't pursue it. So we thought that we would get involved and try to revivify the concept of peace and human rights in, in, uh, in the Holy Land. And why is it, in <coughs> fact, that Israel seems to have recently escaped a lot of criticism, not because they've done any reform, but because people have not spoken up? Well, it's because the United States is involved in a political campaign year, and uh, the supporters of Israel, some of the supporters in Israel, are very critical of any politician who criticizes anything that the government of Israel does. <clears throat> and so the United States has backed away from their active involvement. And as you know, in the last uh, 50 years, the United States has been the primary interlocutor or mediator or conciliator in between the Israelis and their uh, adversaries, the Palestinians and others. And now they are, the United States is not playing any active role. So that's one reason the, United, the elders decided, since there is a complete vacuum there, with the European leaders not inclined to become involved, that we would become involved and at least keep the issue of peace and human rights alive as it relates to the Holy Land. But is there any way you, that the elders can do something about a vital issue like the settlements, for instance? Having spoken out uh, in what I believe is, is the case, uh, I will put on my tin hat and, and get into the, into the trenches. Uh, but I'm not going to be stopped by people who claim, I mean, that I am something that I know I'm not. And at the same time, I mean, very much so, you said that what you saw in Israel something that was quite akin to the situation in South Africa before freedom came to the black people of South Africa. Well, in many instances, worse. It's actually quite uh, distressing. Uh, for one thing, they were we didn't have a war, uh, a war that encroached so very seriously on, on the territory of other people. I mean, many of them t told us that I used to get to my farm in 10, 20 minutes. Now it's two, three hours. And having homes uh, demolished, the Israeli politicians are aware that they can get away with almost anything because the West is guilty. It feels guilty. It feels guilty about what they didn't do uh, in, when the Holocaust happened. And, and they, they, they've given a cut of cut blanche. Now, if they are penitent, they ought to be the ones who pay the price of that penitence, but the price is being paid by the Palestinians. Part of my own concern for what is happening there is, is in fact not what is happening to the Palestinians, but it is what the Israelis are doing to themselves. I mean, when you go to those checkpoints and you see these young soldiers behaving abominably badly, they are not aware that when you carry out dehumanizing policies, whether you like it or not, quite inexorably, those policies dehumanize the perpetrator. That was the sort of reaction in part that you had to your visits. With it was. Well, I've been going there for 30 or more years. And when we negotiated the Camp David Accords, we had two parts. One was peace between Israel and Egypt. The other one was Israel's commitment to guarantee human rights for the Palestinians. They have honored the treaty, but not the human rights for Palestinians. But to answer your sp question specifically, when we go to East Jerusalem, we visit with families living in the middle of the street who have been excluded from their own home that they've occupied for 65 years and now have no place to go because Israeli settlers want to move into their homes. We've been to the little village of Belen in the West Bank, where the Israelis were taking over the entire territory of the farmers, all, to, all of their productive land for, for raising sheep and goats or for growing crops. And we've and been to, to families that have just had their, their homes completely destroyed by Israeli bulldozers because they refused to move. So when we go and see these things happen, 
it, it uh, makes believers out of people who want to see human rights and justice prevail. Absolutely. Well, listening now to President Carter's and Desmond Tutu's outrage at what they had seen in Israel and the occupied territories, I'm struck by something that Desmond said to me in South Africa about his faith and his belief in God. What is it that inspires me? Uh, well, it is the knowledge that you there is there is a God who actually does care. And strangely, I mean, this, this God who is omnipotent is also impotent. This God has extraordinarily said, look, I have created you, and I have created you to be a person. A person is someone who is a moral agent who can choose uh, between good and bad. God can't intervene to stop us from making the bad choices. And so how does evil end? Evil is going to end when there are those amongst God's creatures who want to collaborate with God and the forces of good to end the evil. And actually, I mean, the, the God that I've come to believe in is, is a God who invests more in the saving of sinners than in the celebration of the good, you know? <laughs> fantastic, fantastic, really. Absolutely. We thank you so much for this, uh, Desmond. And I think the best thing to end with is a quote from Nelson Mandela, who said this about you. If Desmond gets to heaven and God denies him entry, then none of the rest of us will get in. And one thing is also certain, when the time comes, God will hear this irrepressible man long before he sees him. <laughs> well, thank you. Mm. Thank you.